now that we know a little bit about colored petri nets, uh, we're going to try and connect colored petri nets, a formal model, to one of the informal models that we learned in the previous lecture. We're going to map some of our AOM models to CPNs. But how exactly do we do this and why do we do this in the first place? So you might get the feeling already based on the examples that you've seen that CPN models are really powerful. But you probably also got the feeling that they're really, really complex. In some situations, it's very hard to know exactly where to start with a CPN model. Another thing to consider is that it's very important to also ensure intermodal consistency. So if you have an AOM model and if you have a CPN model that are modeling pretty much the same thing, it makes sense to keep them consistent with each other. Which is why if you start with an AOM model, you can leverage the advantages of both of them and also creates a feedback loop using the simulation and evaluation capabilities of CPNs. So what you can do in theory is that have an AOM model that is very easy for stakeholders to understand because it's very nice and graphical. And then you can map that to CPN and then use all the simulation and evaluation capabilities, stage-based models, and etc. And then if you figure out there is an issue, you can go back, change your AOM model, and Cycle basically can continue as long as you're satisfied or until you're satisfied. And all of this methodology basically is derived from these authors that uh, design these heuristics for designing um, like all of this mapping of um, AOM to CPN. And you might recognize some of the authors here, most notably uh, the last one, Tavita, is the, also the person who um, um, wrote the book on um, agent-oriented modeling along with another person, Sterling. So now, um, we already have the notation for goal models. We also have the notation for um, CPN models. But now there is also a method of how do we map the notation of goal models to also the notation of CPN models. So inside of a CPN model, you have the notation for these arrows, which are the connecting arcs. And whenever you have a transition in a CPN model, these basically are um, used as the mapping from the sub goals or activities from agent oriented goal mapping. So if you have a goal model and the associated behavioral interface model, you may have a sub goal or an activity which are identical. And when you map this towards a CPN model, you're going to have um, a transition in these places. So um, when you have a trigger or a precondition in your behavioral interface model, these can be uh, mapped using a place with an outgoing arc. So essentially, you can think about in the way that in a CPN model, if you want a transition or a sub goal or activity to be able to fire, then if you have a precondition for this sub goal or activity, it can be represented as a place. Because if you recall, a transition will only fire if your place has a token that is valid with all the guards and everything. So this can be some way that you can map a precondition or a trigger. In, or, yeah. Post conditions similarly, um, so if you have a transition, you can have an outgoing arc and a place, and this can be a very good indication of, okay, once this transition is fired or once this activity is done, the post condition, which is the state or the name of the place, is also satisfied. Um, we will be also, so, so we also considered the, um, the, um, um, the criteria of hierarchical um, CPN models. So if you remember, we, in the videos, we had these goals and we also had the activities and the transitions with double uh, borders. So these are usually represented as the goals. So if you have sub goals and sub activities, these are usually represented in the sub pages. You can also have preconditions and in the place of guards. So you already know that transitions in CPN models can have many, many conditions as guards. So these can also be the preconditions that you have inside of a behavioral interface model. So when you map your behavioral interface model, you can just also map the conditions in terms of guard conditions. So if you see on the right-hand side, we have a activity 
which is modeled in the terms of a um, transition in the CPN. We have a precondition as an incoming uh, place with an incoming arc. We have a post condition and we have a trigger, which is another place with an incoming arc. So if you might recall from our previous lecture, we have um, an agent oriented model, in this case a goal model, of an automated EV charging station. We're going to focus our attention towards the left hand side of that big, big goal diagram. Um, towards the managed charging part, the more interesting part of the EV charging that I would argue. So we know that, um, like a brief recall, we have a charging port and a driver which are both involved with the activity of managed charging. And you have these two sub goals which are to reserve the charging port and also charge the EV. And for charging the EV, you also have the role of the EV which is, in, in, which is included there. And then you also had the sub goals of agreeing on the charging speed, beginning the charging, and then ending the charging finally. And you might also remember that we had this behavioral interface diagram of the same managed charging component of the AOM goal model. And pretty much this is a recap of what we had last time, your basic activities, triggers, preconditions, and post conditions. What we're gonna do now is take this small part of your AOM goal model and behavioral interface model and map that to a CPN model that can also be executed. Here's an example of the managed charging component of, um, in, in terms of a CPN model. So we basically assume that there is some connection to the buy energy sub goal. If you remember the other side of the AOM model had this whole thing about buying energy and like a payment provider and so on. So if you look at the top right side, you have this place called driver has bought energy. So you might recall that there was a, a, um, a precondition for reserving a charging point that driver has already bought energy. So in this case, this precondition is modeled as a place that goes as an incoming arc to reserve charging point. You also recall that um, another precondition was that an EV is ready to charge for reserving a charging point. So as you can see there, you have an EV, you have some EVs inside of the uh, place called EV is ready to charge, and you have it as an incoming place towards the, the transition called reserve CP. And you also have a few guard conditions, for example, that um, the driver has already paid the fee required for reserving the charging point, and also that the driver wants to charge the EV. So all of these conditions can be either a trigger or it could be a guard. We also know that there are these things that happen after a charging point is reserved. We know that um, you see the outgoing arc from reverse CP going to the right hand side. There is a place called driver has reserved CP. So essentially what this happens, if you see the variables inside of this arc, you have EV and CP. So essentially you have a pair of EV and CP which are reserved as um, in a special place called driver has reserved CP. So it's, it's basically an indication of you take, the, you take the EV from the EV is ready to charge place, you take the charging point from the charging point is free place, and then you take both of them and you put them in the other place once you reserve something. And then because it's a CPN model, these places of the charging point is not there inside of this port anymore, which is why it basically prevents this charging point to be reserved while it's in use. So essentially this is how like automatically you can simulate a lot of the conditions that we thought about before. And in this specific example, if you look at the place called EV is ready to charge, there are two tokens inside of it. So more information about exactly how we define the tokens can be found in the video example and also the example CPN file that we provide to you. But essentially we have two tokens and two EVs. So we have an ID, which is one or two. We also have the total charge that the EV can hold and also the, uh, the charging speed that the EV can hold, that the maximum charging speed of the EV. Similar thing we have basically for the charging point. And you might see that the, the next um, activity or the next transition that follows the res reservation is to charge the EV. 
you can see the, the, um, the guard condition in this case is once and also that the charging point ID is the same as the charging point that comes with the reservation. So it always makes sure that the EV um, always charges from the, the charging point that has previously reserved. And you can see, just like our goal diagram, after you charge the EV, the EV has been charged. So we know from the previous place that these double um, bordered boxes are basically a sub-page indication. So inside of the sub-page, we can see that there is more information or another level of abstraction of events happening. So on the left side, you have the same condition as before where the driver wants to charge the EV. And as long as the driver wants to charge this EV um, and, the, and the driver has also reserved the charging point, you still have this place here from the previous, from the previous page. Um, the driver can, the driver's EV and the charging point can agree on the charging speed. If you look at the conditions at the top of this card, you see that the EV's charging speed must be greater than or equal to the charging speed of the CP or the maximum charging speed. And the maximum charging speed of the charging point should also be greater than or equal to the maximum speed of the EV's charging speed. Basically, that is how you can also model the condition that we mentioned before in the behavioral interface diagram, but we did not mention this condition in the AOM goal model. So similarly from before, you have all these conditions that we mentioned in the um, um, inside of the behavioral interface model. So even though you know that um, the charging speed is capable to choose the correct charging speed, you might also need to specify something like you always choose the maximum speed possible depending on the charging point and the EV. So for example, if the maximum speed of the charging point is five kilowatts and the maximum speed of um, um, uh, that the EV is 10 kilowatts, then you would always use five. So essentially the, con the, 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 the ARC inscription that you see going from agree on charging speed to charging speed is agreed upon is a computation of the maximum speed that the charging can take, take place with. Once this happens, you can see that the begin charging transition is, can be fired and the speed basically is, lo is locked and the, and the EV can begin charging. Once that happens, you have end charging and the EV goes into the state of the EV is charged and the charging point goes into the state of it being free. So basically what happens now is that the charging point can now be used by another EV inside of the other page. So this whole process can keep continuing and now we can essentially simulate as many EVs as we like. We can simulate as many charging points as we like. And this is where state space simulations come into play. So we already elucidated the idea of why state-based simulations are great. Um, we also told you like, okay, sometimes they can be great, but the size keeps increasing and increasing. So it's also possible in CPN tools that you can just create the state-based simulation and it will tell you if there are deadlocks, it will tell you if it's always a possibility of reaching a given state and also it will tell you if there is a guaranteed delivery of a given service. These are actually mathematically defined inside CPN tools and a little bit too technical for our discussion today.